Bring the Aramis in. Get the Aramis. <clears throat> As if they burst. Tribune, see this. Stand out, return to camp. Sir? Take it. Stand down. Look for me shortly. Tribune. Sir, we are close. I can feel I it. I need you for this. There are no enemies here. Lord Thomas, where have you been? What an amazing event that happened as Jesus, who was dead, came back to life. It's something that's being celebrated all around the world today. And yet, when it actually happened, only a few knew about it. Don't you catch the power in that? <laughs> That something that happened that was really, in, in, in the day and age in which it happened, it was very insignificant because nobody knew. But it is an event that changed the world and is still changing the world. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I expected this morning to be really tired. <laughs> it's been a great week having these uh, Holy Week services. And I just thought, man, by Sunday, I'm, I'm going to be so wiped out. I told Tim, I called him this morning. I was checking to make sure that we didn't have another pond inside the church. And he said, no, nah, man, everything's great. I said, dude, I feel so good this morning. I really do. I mean, we've had a we've had an amazing week. If you've been able to be a part of any of the services, we've essentially been touching on all of all of the statements that Jesus made as he was hanging there on the on that rugged cross. The first night we looked at the statement that he made when he said, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" Such ominous words. He had had such an intimacy with God, such a closeness with his father. And it was at that moment when Jesus took on the sins of all humanity, when he was caring, as 1 Corinthians says, he who knew no sin became sin. And at that moment, he experienced the separation from God. He experienced the distancing from his father. And that was the one thing that caused him to cry out. Up until that point, Jesus had always referred to his father as daddy and Abba and father. And at that moment, he cried out, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? I know for us, when we feel separated from God, it doesn't seem to phase us sometimes. When there's something going on in our lives and we know that God's not God's not smiling on it. We just tend to kind of go along through life, don't we? Yet Jesus, the first moment when he sensed a distancing between him and the Father, he cried out. The next night, we talked about the powerful uh, uh, words again that Jesus uttered as he looked around and he watched the soldiers and he watched the people jeering at him and snarling at him and he he, he watched the men that had nailed him to that cross and had tortured him for that entire weekend. And he looked at, up to heaven and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we talked about the power of forgiveness. And we gathered at the Lord's table and we celebrated this event that transformed humanity. And then on Friday night, we looked at the the kind of the insignificant phrase that I have read so many times where Jesus was there on the cross and obviously, <laughs> obviously spent of his energy and his, his, his uh, mind was, was beginning to reel and he was beginning to feel the weight of our sin. He was beginning to feel the weight of that moment. And, it, and he says, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. And we looked at the fact that there was a, a dual meaning for that phrase, I am thirsty. In one way, yes, he was thirsty because the crucifixion was notorious for causing dehydration. But we also saw that Jesus said, the scriptures must be fulfilled. It had been told in the Old Testament by the psalmist and the prophets that this Jesus would be nailed to a cross and that he would be thirsty and that they would offer him vinegar as a as a, a means to satisfy his thirst and then we also notice that jesus was revealing his humanity in that moment not only was he god the not only was he god the the son but he was also the son of man fully god and fully man and then last night pastor tim Nailed it. <laughs> no, actually, Mike said that on Facebook. Oh, gosh. When we talked about how Jesus said those awesome words when he said it is finished, and then he bowed his head. And so last night we considered the power of how the completed work of Christ frees us and enables us and empowers us to live the life that he calls us to live. And so as you see the pieces of paper with the, the nails uh, there, those are sins and people's struggles and things that they have been dealing with. And, and we brought those things last night um, and we nailed them to the cross, signifying that it's no longer I who lives, 
but Christ who lives within me. And so this morning, I, I, uh, I wanted to bring this series to a, a, a close, and I wanted us to not only think of the words that Jesus said while he was on that cross, but I want us to consider the power of his words after he came out of that tomb. The power of his words after he made his exit from that tomb. That new life that Jesus offers us. That, that incredible ripple effect that happened when Jesus stepped out of that tomb. That, that ripple effect. What, what he put into motion that early Easter morning is something that is still being felt today. While we live in a world that is full of death and decay and, and, and every other vile thing that you and I can imagine, that humanity can imagine, all of the, the tragedies and the things that people face every day, the resurrection of Jesus offers us new life. It offers us new hope and it changes us. I look at that Roman soldier from the movie Risen and... He was one who was there watching it happen. He was one who was there to make sure that, that Jesus was dead. He was the one that was there to make sure that the body was put in the tomb. He was to make sure that the tomb was sealed. He was to make sure that nobody would snatch the body as had been rumored would happen. And yet, you saw it when he saw that tomb was empty. It changed him, and if you remember the movie, he was a <laughs> he was confused, and he was but but something happened in him as he dropped that sword. In essence, he was dropping his old way of life. You see, the resurrection has a power to change us. Still has the power to change us. I want to read this to you. I found this from Max Licato. It says on Saturday, Jesus is silent. So is God the Father. He made himself heard on Friday. He tore the curtains of the temple. He opened the graves of the dead. He rocked the earth. He blocked the sun of the sky. And he sacrificed the son of heaven. Earth heard much of God on Friday. But nothing on Saturday. Jesus is silent. God is silent. Saturday is silent. Easter weekend discussions tend to skip Saturday. Friday and Sunday get all the press. The crucifixion, the resurrection command our thoughts, but don't ignore Saturday. You have them too. Silent Saturdays. The day between the struggle and the solution, the question and the answer, the offered prayer and the answer thereof. Saturday silence torments us. Is God angry? Did I disappoint him? God knows Jesus is in the tomb. Why doesn't he do something? Or in your case, God knows your career is in the tank. He knows your finances are in the pit. He knows your marriage is a mess. Why doesn't he act? Why? What are you supposed to do until he does? You do what Jesus did. You lie still. You stay silent. You trust God. Jesus died with this conviction. You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Jesus knew God would not leave him alone in the grave. You need to know God will not leave you alone in your struggles. His silence is not his absence. His inactivity is never his apathy. Saturdays have their purpose. They help us to feel the full force of God's strength. So let's think about that for a minute. In a world that seems to be spiraling out of control, he offers us hope. 
We see it all the time. We don't have to look far. Now, with the invention of social media, everything's instant before us. Murder after murder after murder, violence, sexual confusion, rebellion of all kinds. Yet in the middle of that, the resurrection of Jesus still offers hope. Still offers hope. You see, because Jesus overcame death, we don't have to fear death anymore. Did you hear that? Because Jesus overcame death, I don't have to be afraid to die anymore. Amen. It's good news. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, I too can be raised to life. The bottom line here is when we are in Christ, everything changes. So I got to thinking about that this week as we were going through the, the Holy Week services and I said, God, help me to see what kind of things happen. What, what changes take place? What, what does the resurrection, what kind of impact does the resurrection have on our lives? And so I want to give you four things that I feel happen as we read the text, the stories of Jesus coming back to life. What are four things that I noticed? These are four things I, I noticed as... Um, Jesus was raised from the dead. The first thing I believe the resurrection gives us is it can give you a sense of contentment. Contentment is a lost art, isn't it? Come on. It sure is. No one is content anymore, are they? <laughs> Every good salesperson is counting on it. Every company who pays the money to advertise their product is hoping that we never change. They spend billions of dollars every year banking on this truth that we are easily dissatisfied with life. That's why the new cars just keep getting cooler and cooler. That's why every new iPhone that comes out has just a better camera than the one before. Right? It's faster. It's bigger. It's got better screen quality. It's got on and on and on and on. Why do they do that? In fact, I, we were talking about this in the, it, when our elders, when we prayed this morning, when you buy your product, whatever it is you buy, they've already created a better one. I hate that. It's banking on our addiction to being dissatisfied with life. I believe this is one of the, the greatest reasons why the divorce rate is so high. When I don't feel when I've lost that love and feeling, I won't, I won't break into song. <laughs> Not on Easter Sunday. Right? We begin to try to find other ways to fill that gap. Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us this. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, and he equips you with every good, uh, everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, the risen Savior, the victorious one, helps us to experience contentment despite our inability to be content. The God of peace helps us to find peace when we aren't even looking for it. When we're trying to fill that void with something else. Remember in John 14, 27, and this isn't in your notes or on the screen. This is 
Uh, I won't charge any extra. John 14, 27, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. My perfect, in the amplified version, my perfect peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Therefore, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. And then it says, let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance. And let my perfect peace give you courage and strength for every challenge. You see, the resurrected Savior gives to us a sense of contentment. He gives contentment to those whose lives are filled with chaos. He gives contentment to those whose lives are filled with confusion. He gives contentment and perfect peace. And he brings a calm in every circumstance. And he gives you courage. Courage. <laughs> Doesn't that sound nice? Doesn't that sound nice? I think it does. That's what the resurrected Savior can do. Another way I believe the resurrection impacts our lives is it also gives us clarity. 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 Clarity? Seriously? What is clarity? Is that a sinus medicine or something? Because I don't know what it is because I don't know how to experience clarity. I don't even believe it's possible anymore. Our minds are so cluttered these days. There are so many things that get in the way, so much confusion, so much craziness. How is this even conceivable? Well, after the disciples had watched their only hope die, after they had seen Jesus tortured and beaten and battered and <laughs> And, and his, his back ripped open and all the things that they watched take place at that cross, I'm sure they had the same feelings that we had. So much chaos and confusion. It says when the women went to the tomb that morning, they were devastated. They were puzzled. They were doubting. They were uh, uh, just confused. And understandably, they had seen him die. And as they were leaving the empty tomb, they encountered an angel. Not something you see every day. Right? No. Uh-uh. They asked the angel where they had taken the body of Jesus. And here's what the angel said in Luke 24. He ain't here. Oh, wait, that's southern language. Let me... <laughs> he is not here. <laughs> that angel might have been from South Carolina. He ain't here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of the sinners and he must be crucified and on the third day he'll be raised again. What, what was that angel doing? He was, he was reminding them the words that Jesus said and he was bringing clarity in their lives. See how that is? He was helping them to remember what Jesus said. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm in the middle of it, I kind of forget what Jesus said. Sometimes I have people, angels like Tim and my wife, who remind me of what Jesus said. <laughs> or they'll say, hey, didn't Sunday, didn't you say this, this, and this? I'm like, you know what? Stop listening to me on Sunday. <laughs> Just stop. Right? Jesus brought clarity to these poor, distraught women. The, the words of Jesus gave them clarity in the chaos. They were distraught and discouraged and desperate. And the angel reminded them about the things that Jesus had said. In Matthew's gospel, he, it says that, that the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. He's risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay and then go tell the disciples. Don't keep it to yourself. When God gives you that clarity, you need to tell somebody. Tell them he has risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. Probably to warn them because 
Like when the soldier walked in and he saw Jesus, it was like, oh my God. And then Thomas runs in and he's just, he was, he was telling the truth. He's alive. You see, God gave these women and God gave those disciples complete <coughs> clarity. He gave them understanding as he told them to let the others know that Jesus told the truth. He's alive, giving them clarity and hope. And he gave them something to say. Another way I believe the resurrection impacts our lives is it helps us to understand our calling. Helps us to understand our calling. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm called, so are you. I'm called, so are you. I know what you mean by <laughs> You're called. Remember, the cross wasn't the end of the story. Aren't you glad? I'm glad that wasn't the last verse in the Bible, the cross, the death. Although for them, it felt like it was the end, right? All of their hopes were crushed. Jesus had given them hope for their plight at one time. He was, he was, their, their, uh, he was their knight in shining armor, if you will. He was the one that was going to deliver them from the tyranny of the Roman government. They kept saying, uh, when are you going to do that kingdom thing? Right? You keep talking about the kingdom of God. Are you going to do that like, like now? Because that would be really awesome. Because we could use it now. Right? Jesus, I need you now. They watched him suffer and they saw him crucified. They heard him say those words that we talked about last night. It is finished. They heard it. When someone says it's finished, what does that mean? It's finished, unless you're in an argument. <laughs> then you're just getting started, right? <laughs> Jesus said it was finished. They heard it, but now he's alive. This resurrection of the Savior gave them a sense of peace. It gave them that clarity about the future. And then before he ascended to the Father, he gives them their assignments. Homework, y'all. Matthew 28, 19, the risen Savior says, Therefore, now I did all this. I was crucified. I was buried. Three days later, I'm back alive. Here, you see the wounds? Thomas, give a touch. It's real. I'm real. I'm alive. Now go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? That call is still valid today. Isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. If you're a believer, you're a part of that crowd. Every person who calls Jesus Lord of their lives has been given their walking papers. He hands your assignment as you walk out the door. Go. Preach Jesus. Make disciples. Tell them I'm alive. Tell them there's eternal life found in me. Remember in John 17 when Jesus was praying? Tim referenced this last night. Jesus said, Father, just as you have sent me into this world, now I am sending them. Think about that for just a minute. The same calling that is on Jesus is on you. Now look at your neighbor and say, I'm called like Jesus was. You. You're my neighbor because you don't have anybody sitting in front of you. So we'll be neighbors. You're called just like Jesus. That's crazy, isn't it? Because, yeah, it's crazy. Now we know what the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, right? That's why he came. That's a yes or no answer. Yes. Do you know that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost? Okay, I'm just making sure. Well, Jesus was sent and now the river, risen Savior is sending us. He's sending us. Finally, as we go make disciples, the last word the risen Savior speaks. He speaks to give us courage. 
He speaks to give us courage. Jesus says, I am sending you in a world. In fact, I'm sending you into a world that hates you. Thanks. <laughs> Could you have done a little something different there? Really? That's, that's what we got? Yes. He said, they hated me first. They're going to hate you. Don't take it personal. <laughs> They're hating me and you. Okay? But then he says this, and surely I am with you always. Even to the very end of the age. I don't know about you, but that helps. <coughs> it helps me. Maybe it just helps me. Maybe I'm the only person in the room that it helps. Does that help you? Yeah. Yes. To know that as you go, as you are going and preaching Christ, as you're going and making disciples, as you're telling people who Jesus is, as you're living that life and walking that life and, and, and doing the things that God calls you to do, he says, I am with you. You see, the resurrection is more than just a one-time event. The resurrection gives us the hope and the courage that God will be going before us, that he is standing behind us, that he is walking beside us, that he is taking up residence inside of us. Giving us courage. As we go, I invite you to stand and bow your heads with me today. It says in the scriptures that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me. I read that. I hear it think I get it but boy I just don't I struggle to live it so this morning if you have battled if you if you have struggled with that aspect of your walk with Jesus that it just seems so inconsistent It seems haphazard. It, it seems like it's hit and miss. And this morning you would say, God, I'm all, I want to be all in. I want to have that clarity in my life that you gave your followers. I want to, I want to be content. I want to learn how to be at peace with where I am and God, I, I want to have and embrace that calling that you give us to go. And that as I go, I can know that you are with me. If you long for that in your life, as a team leads us in this song, I invite you to come. If today you would say, I don't, have a relationship with Jesus. I go to church. I, I put money in the basket. I, I even do ministry sometimes. But if the truth be known, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. It's purely I do it because I'm supposed to. But today you long to change that storyline. That you want to invite the risen Savior to take up residence in your heart and in your life. As the team leads us, I invite you to come and praise the one. Praise the one. Who took our place gives us hope.
to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still.
that name. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it's in his name we pray. We give glory and honor and majesty this morning, Lord. We honor you and we thank you. We thank you that the cross wasn't the last word. We thank you that the tomb wasn't the last word. We thank you that he's alive. Hallelujah. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah.